One of the things that um, came out of the Unconfidence in Halton and that people asked us to do was just to take a little bit of time to, to talk about what we mean when we use the word innovation. Because it's a bit of a buzzword du jour, isn't it? Everybody's like, oh, we need to be doing innovation. We need to be innovative. We need to stop salami slices and, and do some, some innovation. Um, and sometimes it can seem a, a little bit of a magic bullet without always understanding how it's being done. And for me, innovation, it's, it's not a magic bullet. It's a discipline. It has definitions. It has methodologies. It has tools. And in terms of definitions, I, I like these two. Um, the first one, we've got the curtain slightly cropping it, but the first one is from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And that is the idea that innovation is the embodiment of a useful idea into the marketplace. It's an idea into the marketplace. And I like that because a lot of the time we tend to stop at innovation equals new. And um, innovation with no traction in the marketplace isn't, um, it's just an idea, it's not innovation. The second uh, one I like is from somebody called Tim Castell, who's an Australian academic, and he says that innovation is the process of idea management, and that implies that there is a process. So for me, innovation is idea management, which gains traction in the marketplace. It's not enough to just have an idea, that's being creative. For innovation to work, there needs to be something that you can apply it to that changes something. So let's look at categories, because actually, now we've got a broad definition of innovation. Um, then we also need to, is there anything we can do with these curtains? So, no, okay. I should make you guess what these words are, okay. So, uh, there's, a big, there's a big lever there, I don't know if it opens the curtains anymore. So um, we've, got, we've got different types of innovation. We've got incremental innovation. And I personally don't even know if that should be an innovation category. I think it's something we should be doing anyway. Incremental innovation is listening to our customers, listening to our users, and making improvements with what we've got. It could be cost cuttings, it could be a new feature, but it's just constantly going back and going, okay, let's just not stop here. Um, let's look at how we continue to improve it. And I suppose um, Gmail, if we can move down two slides. Gmail is a good example of incremental innovation. When it came out, it just sent emails. Um, but Google have continued to iterate. They have a lab set up where they're constantly, constantly, constantly refining it, introducing new features, and, and that is incremental innovation. It's what every single one of you should be doing as part of your jobs every day, I think. Um, I guess the iPhone. The iPhone was a radical innovation when it came. It changed how we did things. It changed how we thought. But every, they didn't stop. Um, like most phone and tech companies with version one. Hey, oh, see, do you know what? That's what you need. <laughs> the lady with the power. Thank you. Okay, so we've got, we've got radical, so we've got, so we, um, but every phone that's come up since is, is an improvement. It's different to the last, but it's not that huge leap we first saw when the iPhone was introduced. Radical innovation, radical innovation transforms society. It transforms markets. It's often linked to a fundamental shift in, in perspective that's totally radical. It changes the way we act, the way we think, the way we do things. And a great example, and this is a crazy example, but I love it, because let's go out there from the start. Let's go for a bit of moonshot thinking. A great example of radical innovation is something, has anybody heard of Elon Musk? Has anybody heard of that? Yes, and the Hyperloop, fantastic. So the Hyperloop, these things are about car-sized compartments that travel through low-pressure tubes. A bit like, do you remember when we saw those old films and you're in an office block and they popped a tube in and something sucked it up and it popped somewhere out? You've all seen that. Well, it's a similar, similar idea. And what Elon Musk is saying by if they can do this when they implement this um, is that you can get from San Francisco to Los Angeles in 35 minutes for $20. That's pretty radical. And not only that, but it can be built in less than a decade at a tenth of the projected cost of California's high-speed high rail system. That is radical. Um, and a lot of people went, well, yeah, that's really radical. Even the idea is radical. But you know what? They've started. They've started building on that. Um, something a little bit closer to home. Let's look at something associated perhaps more with health, social care. Um, patient hotels in Sweden, OK? Oh, we just need someone to grab the curtain at the other end now. Okay, so um, patient hotels in Sweden. In Sweden, they were trying to figure out why their patient recovery times were taking so long. Um, and they were faced with, you know, that common dilemma um, that is facing so many of us, 
which is rising demands um, for beds, but with insufficient funds to meet them. So they, they were like, what do we do? We need to do something differently. And their pivot, their shift in perspective came when they stopped seeing patients as patients as patients. Because what they, they did was they took a step back and we saw how we have some patients who are acute. They need to come in. They need quite a lot of resource. We need to fix them and send them on their way. But they had some patients who were, who were in there for longer periods who were recovering. And they didn't need the same things. They didn't need to be on a ward with loads of machines and beeps and nurses moving up and down. In fact, it's probably one of the worst things you can do for recovery is to put somebody in an environment like that. So that was their paradigm shift. And they went, okay, so perhaps we need to sort of treat people differently according to their needs. And um, what they did was they twinned up with a hotel. And they went, okay, what about the idea of a patient hotel? Can we have a specially designed hotel for people to recuperate in? It looks like a hotel. It's really relaxing. It looks really nice. But it's probably one of those little cords you can pull, you know, when you want the crash team to come in. Um, and, but in that hotel, there's also nurses, your family can stay, your friends can stay, um, and patients, it's a lot about self-care, so patients are involved in doing their own bandages, making their own meals. Um, nurses, they dress like hotel staff, and you know what, they're also trained in hotel management, and relatives are able to check in, and that's nice, not just nice, but it means that actually, because you care and you're invested in that person's recovery and well-being, you're often providing vital assistance during the recuperation process. And um, we heard about involving people in co-production. For me, that's a great example of co-production. It's not just a great example of co-production. Do you know what? The recovery rate shortened significantly, and they made massive cost savings, which were equivalent in, in our money to about £90 per bed per day. That's pretty radical, and that, and that was about a shift in the way we view things, a shift in perspective. It's a pivot. 3D printing. You must all have heard about 3D printing now. Okay, were you aware that your next home could be 3D printed? Um, very quickly, in March 2014, there was a competition in China um, to see uh, who could build a 3D printed house in a day. And the company that won print built 10 of these in a day for less than 3,000 pounds each. And it was a giant 3D printer which printed concrete, which is amazing, isn't it? But would you want to live in that? Probably, probably not. But do you know what? 10 months later, that's what the same company were doing. It's not so hard to imagine that perhaps our next home could be 3D printed. 3D printing is radical. I think you've probably got an idea of radical uh, innovation now. So let's talk about the next category, disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation, it's not this moonshot radically departure from where we are, but it creates an entirely new market category or it disrupts an existing market and replaces it with something new. And often the people who are the market leaders, they're not really aware of this. They're not really looking over the horizon and seeing disruption as a threat. Because when disruption starts to come onto the market, often the things that people are introducing aren't very good. They kind of break a bit. They're not as good as the existing one. Um, and, and, um, and so it's different to radical. And, so, and um, I suppose, for example, I was thinking about this in terms of how do we make it relevant. But local authorities, in a way, you kind of got the monopoly, haven't you? You're probably not looking over the horizon going, OK, you know, what's going to happen? What do we need to be aware of? What's happening out in the world that could disrupt what we're doing? How do we innovate according to it? Um, so if you think about somebody, maybe refuse. We've already, how, how long have we been collecting refuse as local authorities? Over 100 years more? Yeah? You've probably got some guy sitting in the depot thinking, do you know what? We're the council. No one's going to come and take refuse away from us. And that's vulnerable because whilst it's fact that councils collect litter, it's not unquestionable or unthinkable that somebody could do it. The public pound for less and better. And so we do need to be thinking, even with the things that we think can't be changed, that there may be better. There may be an Elon Musk around the corner about to hyperloop all that rubbish out of nosy. So what that kind of brings about is something called the innovator's dilemma. Because actually, do you know what? When you've got the market share, when you're the big boy in the market, you don't really want to cannibalize what you've got to do something different. Because that means dismantling stuff you've created. And psychologically, we don't really like, we tend to want to protect what we've got. We fear losing it more than we have an appetite for change. And that's relevant because I think sometimes when we're looking at 
at public services and, and we, we were doing a think tank with government ministers the other week and one of the big things there is how do we dis how do we displace the incumbents it's a big barrier because we tend to try and protect what we've got even when there may be a better smarter way for patients for users of services for staff of doing it it's quite hard isn't it particularly perhaps when you're in the public sector and a great example of disruptive innovation flying through is um, the old blockbusters versus Netflix. I love this because um, when, when the CEO and the senior management of blockbusters first heard of the whole Netflix idea, they, they gave this great quote, which was basically, we can't see any reason why this new upstart technology could possibly be relevant. This is what happened shortly afterwards. This is the share prices. Oops. It was relevant. That was a massive market disruption. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, open innovation. You probably heard of open innovation. Um, open, open innovation is based on the idea that the smartest people aren't in the room already. Okay? So can you establish some process or some platforms to get knowledge from the outside in, but at the same time push um, the knowledge that you have within outside so you get something better than you might be able to do. We just worked in the traditional firm way where we have all our staff and they're all in-house. So this is open innovation um, and we often see this um, with challenges, maybe in health. You may have seen health challenges, a call for you know, people to enter, maybe get £100,000 some mentoring, but the company that's issuing it or, or the government actually gets a solution to a problem they've been struggling with for a while. Open IDEO, I think we've got a slide on that. Um, is a web-based platform that shares social challenges and encourages people globally um, to help them solve it. So open innovation is really about bringing different perspectives and skill sets to come in that aren't bound by the little echo chamber of your organisation. So it's really important um, if you're looking at innovating quite cheaply but rapidly. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> I kind of really like to bring it back to this. A lot of the stuff we've talked about, people are like, yeah, but that must have taken years, it must have cost millions, it's really shiny. Do you know innovation can just be simple stuff that we tinker with and we do to solve a problem. Innovation can be a quick, cheap fix. And here are two examples of things that people have done. And that's innovation. At the beginning, though, I, I said that innovation is a process. and. Um, at its most simple, it's something like this. We define our problem clearly, we have a well-articulated challenge, we understand it, we come up with lots and lots of ideas. To have one great idea, you have to have lots of them, and then we come up with a solution. Next slide. This is the process we use at SOMO, and it's based on a process of user-centered design, but you can see that there is a process that we go through. To be truly innovative, you are probably going to have to follow some kind of process. And finally, this is my big one for you, innovation killers. Okay, I'm not really going to read this out, but I just want you to look at them um, and think, are these, do you, do you recognise any of these? Okay, next one. Hold on, John. No, could you just go a bit slower? Go back to that last one. Okay, next one. Next one. He nods at that one. And this is a biggie for me. It's the idea that innovation is someone else's job. We have a department, we have somebody, a transformation, an innovation person, it's not everybody's job. And um, I don't know if that's true because I think innovation is and should be everybody's job. Everybody sees things every day. Everybody has ideas about how things could be improved. We just don't always have the systems and processes in place to kind of use that, to engage those people. And that's really relevant for today because today is really about saying innovation is everybody's job. It's your job. You all work and you all care somehow about that initial challenge that we outlined. How can we help people to lead happier, healthier lives for longer? And um, at that, I'm going to kind of stop telling you perhaps what we think innovation is um, and hand over properly now for the rest of the day to you.